Hello, everybody, and welcome to Written in Blood. My name is John, and today I'm going to be doing my March TBR, and I think I've got like five books. So let's go ahead and get underway. I hope the lighting's a little bit better. I kind of adjusted it and everything. I hope it does look better. And I'm going to have the book, uh, the books themselves pop up on screen here in a moment. Uh, the first one I want to read is Lovecraft Country, and this by Matt Ruff. And I've got these synopsises printed out here because they're all Kindle editions. So anyway, man, my Kindle is on my phone and I'm using my phone to record. So Chicago, 1954, when his father Montrose goes missing, 22-year-old Army veteran Atticus Turner embarks on a road trip to New England to find him. Accompanied by his uncle George, publisher of the Safe Negro Travel Guide, and his childhood friend Leticia. On their journey to the manor of Mr. Braithwaite, heir to the estate that owned one of Atticus's ancestors, they encounter both mundane terrors of white America and malevolent spirits that seem straight out of the weird tales George devours. At the manor, Atticus discovers his father in chains, held prisoner by a secret cabal named the Order of the Ancient Dawn, led by Samuel Braithwaite and his son Caleb, which is gathered to orchestrate a ritual that shockingly centers on Atticus, and his one hope of salvation may be the seed of his and the whole Turner clan's destruction. A, chimer a chimerical blend of magic, power, hope, and freedom that stretches across time, touching diverse members of two black families, Lovecraft Country is a devastating kaleidoscopic portrait of racism, the, terrifi the, ter excuse me, the terrifying specter that continues to haunt us today, and that is Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. Okay. Next up is Bottled by Stephanie Ellis. The house was his, an unwanted and unwelcome inheritance. As a child, Tyler Vitram spent many miserable hours beneath its roof, hating his grandfather and the man's housekeeper, Mrs. Waits. His only escape during those vis visits had been via the, the impossible bottles created by his granddad, bottles holding miniature worlds in which he could lose himself for hours. Sometimes, however, he sensed something else living in the house and in the bottles, and when he returned home, he took the nightmares with him. Now an adult, Tyler decides one last visit can do no harm, allow him to finally shake off his nightmares. The bottles, however, are waiting, and so is Mrs. Waits. As both house and bottles gradually yield up their secrets, it is made clear to Tyler what is expected of him and what will happen should he fail. Is Tyler master or servant of the house? Okay. And that's going to be for Bottle by Stephanie Ellis. Uh, that one was one that was a, uh advanced reader copy or a, or a copy that was sent to me by uh, Silver Shamrock Publishing. Um, and I believe um, Love Curve Country. I bought that one on my Kindle. So, right. and next up, another one that Silver Shamrock sent me as an ebook, and that is the Corruption of Alston House. And this is by John Quick. Catherine's life has been on a downhill turn, filled with tragedy and heartbreak. When she bought Alston House in the small Tennessee town of Poplar Bend, she hoped it would be the chance to turn things around send herself again, and get serious about her art. True, it was a risk buying a house virtually sight unseen through the Internet, but she knew it needed some extensive renovations, so what could go wrong? What the real estate agent never told her was that Alston House had a history that was among the darkest secrets in the small town. As Catherine begins to put her life back together following her dreams as a painter, she discovers there is more here than meets the eye. One of the home's former residents never left, even after the even, even after death, and now he seems to have set have set his sights on her. Can she uncover the darkness at the heart of the town and overcome her personal ghost, or will she become one more victim to the town's hidden, to the town's hidden hearts? Okay, and that is for the corruption of Alston House, and that is by John Quick. All right, and next up. And this is a short story collection that I bought on my Kindle. And this is Lullabies for Suffering. It's by various um, authors. Addiction starts like a sweet lullaby sung by a trusted loved one. It washes away the pains of the day and wraps you in the warmness of the womb where nothing hurts and every dream is possible. 
Yet soon enough, this warm state of bliss becomes a cold shiver. The ecstasy and dreams become nightmares, yet we can't stop listening to the lullaby. We crave to hear the siren song as it rips us apart. Six stories, three novellas, three novelettes, written by a powerful list of talent, all featuring the insidious nature of addiction, damaged humans craving for highs and wholeness, but finding something more tragic and horrific on the other side. This features Carolyn Kepnes, the author of You and Hidden Bodies, Keelan Patrick Burke, author of Sour Candy and Ken. I read Ken, and it's absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend it. Uh, Mercedes M. Yardley, author of Pretty Little Dead Girls. That's an author I've not read, I don't think. John F. D. Taff, author of The Fearing. and He also wrote a book on the Bell Witch, which is excellent. Mark Matthews, author of Milk Blood. And Gab uh, Gabino Iglesias, author of Coyote Songs. Okay. Excuse me, I got a little itch on my nose there. And finally, I have, and this one is one I'm reading right now, and I'm about 20-something pages in. It's maybe 101, 102 pages. And it's so far, it's absolutely awesome. And this is The Final Reconciliation by Todd Kiesling. Take off your mask. Thirty years ago, a progressive rock band called the Yellow Kings began recording what would become their first and final album. Titled The Final Reconciliation, the album was expected to usher in a new renaissance of heavy metal, but it was shelved following a tragic concert that left all but one dead. The sole survivor of that hor horrific incident was the band's lead guitarist, Aidan Cross, who's kept silent about the, about the circumstances leading up to that ill-fated performance until now. For the first time since the tragedy, Aiden has granted an exclusive interview to finally put rumors to rest and address a question that has haunted the music industry for decades. What haunt, excuse me, what happened to the Yellow Kings? Inspired by the King and Ye the answer will terrify, excuse me, the answer will terrify you. Inspired by the King in Yellow mythos first established by Robert W. Chambers and reminiscent of cosmic horror by H.P. Lovecraft, Laird Barron and John Langan comes the final reconciliation, a chilling tale of regret, the occult, and heavy metal by Todd Kiesling. And uh, one thing they should have mentioned in that is it also pays tribute to Ambrose Bierce, who is the creator of, uh, excuse me, the elder god uh, Haster, who first appeared in the story uh, Haida, Haida the Shepherd by Ambrose Bierce. And in the book, it also mentions Las Carcosa, and Ambrose Bierce is also the uh, creator of Carcosa. And the first time it appeared was a story called An Inhabitant of Carcosa. So anyway, that does it. That is my March TBR. Uh, March is my birthday month. In fact, in the next, oh, maybe two hours, maybe, or two and a half hours or something like that, I'm going to be 58 years old. I um, kind of have mixed feelings about that. Um, um, so, yeah, anyway. And uh, it, it has so far this year hasn't been a very good year. Uh, I haven't mentioned it to anybody, but um, I don't know if you've ever seen when I do some of my videos, uh, the black cat that's usually in the room with me. Uh, on Valentine's Day, he uh, disappeared and we have since found out that there is someone going around our neighborhood who is taking uh, our cats, taking other people's cats, and they're just dropping them, them off at uh, unknown locations. Uh, one lady found her, uh, her cat, uh, found him about five, maybe six miles away. Uh, we've been to every shelter, and we, you know, we've done everything we can. We put up flyers. We've asked around. And still, it's been going on three weeks now, and still nothing. In fact, I think it's been, well, it's going on, yeah, about three weeks, and still we've not heard anything. And I think that's the thing that bothers me the most, is that I have absolutely no closure. Uh, the thing about it is, is that Poe, his name was Poe, and we had another cat that's gone missing too, named Jasper, but, but Poe, we had him since he was a kitten, and... He's Nelly. He's part of our family. All these cats are parts of our, are part of our family, but Poe was just uh, just incredibly special to me and to my wife. Uh, he used to love to hang out here in the man cave with me. In fact, he 
would wait to, for me to open the door and I turn on the light and he's so quick he would be in the room it's almost like he teleported into the room he just loved to wrestle around with me uh, he loved to just sit on my lap and just do nothing and he just loved to hang out and he would sleep with me in the mornings in the afternoons or whatever when I would sleep after getting off of work so yeah I mean losing him is like losing a, uh, uh, a you know it's losing a part of my family you know and people you know and I have no closure and I think that is just one of the cruelest things you can do to somebody. And yes, it has been reported to the police because uh, we did talk to police and they said not only is it theft, but it's also animal cruelty. So I'm trying my best to stay hopeful and hopefully um, he'll come back. You know, we can get him back and get our other animals back too. Anyway, uh, I don't mean to bring you guys down because um, I'm already a little bit down about this in the first place. Uh, so anyway, um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and have a great day and good night.